Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today for the Open Alex webinar series. Um, today is one I'm really excited about. We've needed to do this for a long time, but we're waiting for a new feature to launch. So this is going to be a combination of talking about how to build custom queries in Open Alex, but also talk a little bit about the new feature that we just launched this week and how that really helps do that. As always, the slides and presentation will be available on our website afterwards, and you can find them on our YouTube channel as well. Feel free to ask questions as we go in the Q&A, and my colleague Jason Portnoy might answer them live, but we might also wait for the non-recorded Q&A afterwards. Okay, so quick presentation at a glance for, for today's topic. Um, a little bit of context, but then I want to dive straight into query building and first talk about the foundations of designing and evaluating queries generally, and then talk specifically about how to do some of this in Open Alex. And then, as always, we'll go to the, the question and answer. So for the context in this, I wanted to bring back a slide that I have shown in most of the webinars that I've given. And it's this really simple idea we talk about where research intelligence and the whole way we're structuring Open Alex is around building filters to get a subset of the works that you need and then doing analyses with the group by feature. And I've shown this slide many times, but um, I wanna show something that we should be showing every time we show it. That is gonna be the subject of today's talk, which is this important step between going from results to analyses. And it's this quality assurance, quality control step. And the question we should be asking here is, we've designed this logic layer, which is great. We have the set of works, but was that the set of works we were hoping to find? And you really should be asking this question no matter what you're doing. If you're doing a systematic review, if you're doing research analytics, uh, research intelligence, this question should be asked. And if the answer is yes, the, the logic layer or the query we built did a great job, then you can go forward and do your analyses. But if it didn't, and that's where this no is, you really need to refine that, rock, that logic layer and, and start again from the beginning. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And that piece is really about reflecting on how to design and evaluate those queries. So first, first question that we ask is why do we design queries? And the answer, is probably intuitive to most people, but you only want to find the works that are relevant to your particular use case. Open Alex has over a quarter billion works now, and most people only are looking for between one and a thousand works when they're going on there. And so it's really about using the database to look for just what you're looking for. And that can be as a researcher or a grad student who only wants to know about the new research on um, or new publications on the research that they're interested in. That could also be someone doing knowledge synthesis, so either um, systematic reviews or meta-analyses, but they want to be able to find all of the research on a particular topic, and they want to be confident in being able to say that they found all the research on a topic. Otherwise, the inferences aren't as uh, credible. But this also applies to research intelligence, and we've talked a lot about this and how people and institutions are starting to evaluate research based on, on these queries that they construct that are just institution is, for instance, Simon Fraser University. That's a really simple example, and we've talked a lot about that, those in previous webinars. So today I just want to talk more about the use cases for keeping up on research and, and knowledge synthesis. But I do want to say that these two really aren't as different as they seem. Um, the term research intelligence, I believe, was first used for people who were doing systematic reviews to get a sense of what research has been published and what is still missing. And some universities are doing quite a bit more sophisticated research intelligence than just using things like their institution filter. They're working with their libraries to design custom queries. And we had a great example of, of one way of doing this from EPFL a few months ago. But when we do this, no matter um, how we're designing, we need to ask the question of how effective our queries actually worked. And really this comes down to what your end goal is, but a couple of things that we should always ask or a couple of metrics that can help you assess that, that effectiveness. So how confident are we that our results list and downstream analyses are accurate to what we think they are? And there's two very common metrics that people use to approach this. And the first is just knowing how common are false positives in our, um, in our database. So let's say we say this is our, the list that we're looking for. How many of those works that are in there shouldn't actually be there? Those are precision errors. And then the other one is a false negative. So how many works should have been in the set that aren't in that set or they're missing from it? And those are false negatives or recall errors. 
Now, if you were with us six months ago, um, we did a, a exercise with 14 universities where we were, were measuring precision and recall of our own machine learning classifiers to figure out how effective they were at finding an institution's documents. And so we've already calculated precision and recall internally for a lot of our use cases, but these can be used in all queries. And so we'll go right into that. Um, the first precision, the way that you calculate this is pretty simple, um, but the general idea here is of the works that came in our set, what percentage of those should have been in our set or were the ones that we were hoping to find? And the way that you do that is by retrieving your results, pick a random subsample of those results. And I say that because sometimes these queries can result in millions of works and you, you can't go through and classify all of them as relevant or not. So take a random subsample. And it is really important that it's random because if you sample just the top most cited or the most recent, you might find something very different that isn't representative of the entire sample. So pick a random subsample. I usually recommend at least 100. 100 tends to be a pretty good amount when it's random to give you a sense of how well something is working. Um, but also if you only have 15 publications and that's the, the entirety of it, you can use that entire sample. But then it's going through those works and then tagging them as either relevant to what you're looking for or not. And there's a lot of resources out there that talk about how you can develop specific criteria to go through before you evaluate them and decide whether or not something should be included or something is relevant to your use. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but it is something to think about that very often, if you haven't thought about what is going to make something relevant before you start looking at it, it might change as you start looking at it. So having some criteria about what's relevant and what's not before you get started is really helpful. And then if you don't actually have criteria until after you've gone through your whole list, that's okay, but you need to develop them after looking through your whole list and make sure that you've used the same sort of criteria throughout. But after that, it's as simple as, as summing the number of those works that were relevant and dividing it by the total number of, of works in your subsample. And just to give you an example, um, I chose a friend asked over the weekend. She was interested in a very specific field that she didn't think there'd be a lot of information on. And it was something around um, international governance of activities in outer space. Very specific field, and she wanted to find work on that. And we weren't really sure how to start. So we came up with a, a couple of queries just by looking around in Open Alex, and you can't really see this on the screen, but we use the new keyword feature that I'll talk about in a moment, and then limited to Canada and then um, a certain year range. For that, I downloaded the works from Open Alex, and you can see I, I added a column over on the right called relevant, and I just went through and read the title and abstract of those works to get a sense of whether or not that was actually what we were looking for. And I classified them as yes or no, and then at the very end, I just counted the total number of yeses and divided that by the total number of works. So you can see eight were correctly identified, five were not, so then there were 13 total. So our precision here is 62%. Now, this might seem really low, and usually you'll want precision that's much higher than that, but sometimes that doesn't matter. And the reason why is maybe there's only eight publications on this topic, and um, you actually did get them all here, and you're just using precision to figure out which of these lines you want to delete from your work, uh, from your database. So that's why I want to make a point here to say 62 seems like a low number, but if that's getting you all the documents you're looking for, and it just means you have to get rid of, I guess, 38% of the works to make it a perfectly curated list, then that's actually not a problem at all. And it all comes down to sort of, um, you know, what the, what the needs are. You'll see down at the bottom, I put a little um, a little pro tip, I call it here. So typically when people are doing these works, they'll download the entirety of, of the, the results list and then randomly sample in something like Excel. But we've actually added a feature in Open Alex. Um, you can see the parameters called and sample equals whatever number you want to use. So in this example here at the bottom, you can see api.openalex.org. Um, I've got an institution that I chose, and I said, randomly sample 100 works and give me just the DOI and title. And I want to show that because this is actually something you can do really rapidly to assess how effective your query is. So you can see for this institution, it brought up 100 works because I said, um, I said sample equals 100. And I said, just give me the title and the DOI so that I can really quickly go through, read these, and see if these are 
relevant to my topic. So this is something you can do that make things really quick. We haven't put a random sampler in the export from the user interface, um, but if people are interested in that, let us know because it's something we could do. Okay, but I said, maybe if you get all of the works that you were looking for, it's not bad to have a low precision. So I wanna talk now about recall. And recall, um, I've already sort of introduced it this way, but sometimes it's thought of as the inverse of precision. So of all the works that I wanted to be returned, what percentage was actually returned. And this takes a little bit more um, finessing or maybe art and science to come up with, with this because you, you don't know what all the works in the world you want returned are. If you did know that, you wouldn't have to do a query at all. Um, so the way that we do this is first retrieve your results um, from, your, from your search, but then you also need to retrieve what we call a gold set. And when I was talking about institutional matching uh, six months or so ago, a gold set and for us was a list of, of publications that an institution told us were their works. So we could see how many of them we were getting to test our recall. Um, but a gold set here might be, um, you have 15 publications that you know are definitely on the topic, or um, you have a list of keywords that are very specific and you use that to generate a small set of publications, but you have some source of truth. Once you have that source of truth, you're just gonna match across those two databases to see of the ones that we know should have been returned, what percentage of them were returned? So if your gold set had 100 publications and only 30 of them were returned, that's a very low recall. You were only getting 30% of what you're hoping to get. And just to show you an example of, of how you can do that, um, these are two side-by-side -side Excel spreadsheets you can see. So one is, I, I put sort of down at the bottom a very clear, very clear um, title. So the one on the left is the query results, and this is an open Alex export. And then the one on the right is gold set. And this is something that was curated separately. It's the title and, and DOI of a bunch of works. And you can see I added a column. So on the one on the left, it's column Z. The one on the right, it's column C called returned by query. And I, on the column Z, the, uh, on the export, I just added this and put everything as a yes, because everything in that document was returned as yes. And then on the gold set document, I added this new column that says returned by query. And you can kind of see at the top that there's a, uh, a formula that is figuring out what to call that, yes or NA. And all the yeses means that it found that DOI in my gold set or in my both gold set and query results. So it's in both of those. If there's an NA, that means that that DOI in the gold set was not found in the query. So in this example, you can see there were 25 publications, um, 22 were returned, there were three that were NA. So the recall there is 22 divided by 25 or 88%. Now, these are both really helpful things to measure. I'm not gonna give you a, um, a cutoff of what's helpful. And the reason why is um, because it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do a systematic review and definitively say that something does not exist in the literature, you need to have as high a recall as possible. And it's more important to have close to 100% recall even if your precision is 10% because you wanna capture everything. And sometimes that's not your use case. So really this is about reflecting on what you were hoping to get and, and ways of refining it. And the way the reason I say that is because if you come up with a number like 88% here, the idea is that then you're gonna identify that what's missing, like what, what is it about the three in the gold set that kept them from being returned and trying to tweak your, your query to get that higher. But the, the gold set one in calculating and recall is a little bit more complex and subjective because you need to come up with your own gold set. If you've never done that before, a couple of ideas that people use to, to come up with their, their gold set. The first is asking researchers for specific, um, for specific works. And I know a lot of librarians support researchers on doing these systematic reviews and they sit down with them and say, can you give me tangible examples of exactly what you're looking for? And that's a really great place to start because they intuitively know the ones that they're looking for that they know of, and you can use those to find the ones that they don't know about. Another really helpful thing is if there's a journal that's committed to the field. 
So um, I study seaweed biology. Um, the name of our field is phycology, and there's actually a journal of phycology that is committed to, to just seaweed or um, algal biology. There's another journal called Applied Phycology that is all about the applications of algae towards industry. And so I'd have a good sense that everything in that journal is something that could be related to that. So these are ways that you can find even more works. Another one that I really like uh, is the related works feature. For any work in Open Alex, you can click on related works and it's gonna find you 10 works that are related based on, um, right now it's based on concept similarity. In the coming months, you're going to see we're adding a bunch of new features on how to find similar works, similar authors, similar journals, things like that, that are going to be a little bit more enhanced. But some of these are pretty helpful now. So if you have a very specific topic and you're not sure how to even search for words, but you have one paper, starting with there can be really helpful. And then if you find a second one, you can then do related works to that and sort of keep snowballing that way. Then there's always checking references for reviews on a topic. So if you know that there is a systematic review that already exists on a topic, looking through all of the references, and you can do that in Open Alex, and I can show that a bit later, define new keywords, for instance. And then finally, curate a list of papers with a known group of experts. So sometimes people say, I don't have any works in mind, but I know the foremost leaders in this field. And you can look at all of their works and use that to sort of find the ones that you're looking for. But in all of these analyses, there's going to be a tension between balancing precision and recall. Anything that you do to increase your recall is going to make your result set bigger. And that's also going to bring in the um, precision errors because you're getting more work, but you're also likely to, to get some that aren't relevant. And any efforts you do to shrink your result set or increase precision is going to decrease your, your recall as well. So there's always a tension between these two. And if you had perfect recall and perfect precision, you wouldn't need to do querying at all because you already have your, your list. Um, but you're always trying to figure out what's the most important for what you're doing. Recall is often preferred in systematic reviews because you're trying to say everything that does exist. And often they'll err on the side of including way more than they need and then manually removing things that are irrelevant. Precision is often preferred in research intelligence. So if you're doing analyses on people, it's okay if you miss a couple of their publications, but it's not usually okay if you've um, included publications from a completely different field and completely different person. Obviously you wanna get as close to 100% usually on both of these, but there are some trade-offs. So I just bring that to your attention. If you go through this and decide that you do need to increase recall or precision, sort of approaches to, to both when you're refining your query. And to increase precision, you want to look through all of the works that were not relevant. So in that one spreadsheet, the ones that I said relevant equals no. Um, is there anything about those works that can be uh, directly included in the query as something to omit? And in that specific one, I saw there was a, a journal of astrobiology and every single work I found in astrobiology was not relevant to what I was actually looking for. So I could then say, and not in this journal, to increase the query accuracy upstream. And then the second one, it's the same idea for increasing recall. Look at the, the gold set, the works that were missed by your query. Are there any keywords or topics or journals that can be added to your query to help get them your second time around? And that's sort of the, the general approach and foundations of, of evaluating your queries. Now I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about how you do some of this in Open Alex. First and foremost, I want to say if you haven't seen docs.openalex.org, please check it out. Um, we don't have a massive team, so we can't do the same sort of uh, responding to individual query requests that we get all of the time in support tickets, but we do try and make the docs as accessible and accurate as possible so that um, people can get the answers they need very quickly from us. On that note, if you ever see something that isn't in there that you have a question on, it's probably not just you who has that question. So let us know that it's missing from the documentation and we'll get it. Um, but I'd also throw out here that we do weekly office hours, uh, two one hour slots each week where you, you can just pop in a room and talk about Open Alex. And this is a really great venue to troubleshoot your queries. So just putting that out there as well, so feel free to come to that. When you're querying Open Alex, 
the general approach here is to use our filters. And this is just a screenshot this morning of all the filters that are available in the user interface. There's 47 of them. And these filters are sort of the, the basis, the bread and butter of what you're able to do with your query construction. If you see something that isn't in there that you think would be helpful, let us know because we're able to add uh, filters and we have added some. Even this week, as I look at that list, there's one or two that are new. Um, so we're all constantly adding new filters that can help people do their queries. Most of these we've talked about in the sense of research intelligence. So I wanna filter by a country or I wanna filter by an institution. Um, but we, what we haven't spent a lot of time talking about in these webinars is what we call aboutness filters. And these are usually what people are using when they're building queries. So I wanna spend some time on those. Aboutness as we think about it is, is basically just what a paper is about, what the subject area is, what the content is about, and people wanna be able to find works about a topic. These are the different filters that we have in Open Alex or approaches to aboutness. And I wanna talk about the pros and cons in building your custom areas. So you'll see the filter on the left, uh, the, the number of groups within that filter, the familiarity of, of users to those uh, filters, and then the fit to custom areas. We've talked a lot about the sustainable development goals. There's 17 of those, really high familiarity around the world because it's a global blueprint that many countries are using. But the fit to custom areas is actually quite low um, because there's only 17 groups and they were designed with, with very specific ideas in mind. So coming up with something specific and using those outside of that is, is quite challenging. So pretty low fit to custom areas. Though I will say there's some really cool examples people have done of looking at specific sub areas of the STGs themselves that, that can very easily be done. Domains, we introduced these a few months ago, but these are the high level life sciences, physical sciences, health sciences, social sciences, um, really high familiarity. Most people have an idea of what those mean, really low fit to custom areas. Fields are part of that same taxonomy and I should say, Domains, fields, subfields, and topics are all sort of um, part of the same classifying scheme, but they're different levels in the hierarchy. So fields have 26, also have high familiarity. Most users, when they read those, know exactly what they are, but low fit to custom areas. Subfields, you also have high familiarity, but because there's 252 of those, you're more likely to be able to use them in a meaningful way in custom research areas. Topics, there's 4,500 of these. Low familiarity, most people when they read the topic titles don't really have a good sense of what that means, but they can be used in a very effective way at creating custom um, research areas. And I put medium to high here because sometimes they can be used more effectively than others. Sometimes you can get a really good fit and sometimes it's better than subfields, but uh, not quite that, that high. Then there's keywords, and keywords is our new feature that just launched this week. There's 26,773 of them. Really uh, medium familiarity, and I say that because most people will read the keywords and there'll be things that are intuitive, like kelp forest uh, and things that you can Google, but um, the, the fit to custom areas is really high. You can combine them in a lot of different ways to create custom areas. The Microsoft, uh, the MAG concepts, Microsoft Academic Graph, I'm not going to spend time on today. We've talked a lot about how we've been moving away from those. There's 65,000 of them. The familiarity is very high because they're linked to Wikipedia. So any of them you can look at Wikipedia. The fit to custom areas is really variable. I've seen some fantastic examples of where these do a good job and some examples where they provide some extremely misleading results. So I'm not going to talk more about those today. We, we are currently thinking about what we might be able to do to, um, to fix some of the misleading results. But for now, I'm going to talk about um, the topics, keywords, and then at the bottom here, text queries. Text queries is what a lot of people are, are actually thinking of when they're doing query building. The number of groups is infinite because you can combine them in so many different ways. The familiarity is very low, though. If you show somebody a string of text query that you've developed, they're usually not very familiar with it. But you can make this as specific as you need. I'm not going to spend much time on the SDGs, but just a reminder that we use an MBERT uh, machine learning model that was developed by the Aurora Universities. And every time a work has a relevant score above or equal or above 0.4 to an SDG, it gets tagged as that. So some works have most multiple SDGs, some have none. 
the topics, we, we introduced these several months ago now, but this is um, there's a link at the bottom to a white paper that describes it. But basically, when a new work comes in, we're taking information on the title, the abstract, what works it's citing, the journal it's in, and trying to classify it into the CWTS topic structure. And you can see over on the right, that sort of um, hierarchy I described earlier, where each work gets a primary topic. That topic gets one subfield, one field, and one domain. So it's a very intuitive way of understanding things. But I did want to add a little bit of complexity here that we don't normally talk about that can be very helpful when you're designing custom queries. And it's like this idea of primary topic versus topics. In the user interface, the only thing you're going to see is the primary topic. And so I have an example here of one of my works. And if you look down at the bottom, it says topic, ecological dynamics of marine environments. But if you look in the API for the same work, you'll see it's called primary topic. And that's the one topic that we've classified as the most important for this work. And all of the user interface features are based around that. But there's quite a bit you can do with uh, the other topics that this work has been classified to. And so you'll see the next piece down is topics. And there's three different topics here. The top one is obviously the primary topic. That's how we decide what the primary topic is. But then you, you're able to have uh, two more topics under that. And you can see some of these are a pretty good fit. So the score for marine biodiversity and ecosystem function is still a pretty good fit here. So I introduced these to say, if this is something people are really interested in queries, there might be ways that we integrate it into the user interface without confusing the existing users. But you can do all of this now in the API. And just to give you an example here, here's you can see these API queries are exactly the same, the same topic, but the difference is that you're filtering by primary topic and total topics. And you can see the first one has 25,000 works. The, the second one has almost 65,000 works. So quite a bit more work are able to be recalled using that. There's also going to be more precision errors when you do that, but you have that flexibility if you do want to do that more broadly. And I will just say, I mentioned earlier that we're working on some things that help find more related works, authors, journals. Part of our approach to doing that is looking through all of the topics that something has some classification to in a sort of fingerprint way, and then finding them based on those fingerprints. So stay tuned on those. But I did want to introduce the our new keywords. Um, these are not author provided keywords, and I wanted to make that very clear at the upfront. I think a lot of time people have the expectation that they're searching in the title abstract and author provided keywords. The problem with those, well, there's a couple of them. The metadata is not always available, and that's a very real challenge, um, but they are also not a defined list. So you can have seven or eight different variations of the same word in author provided keywords. So that presents a challenge to us. And the way we have approached this is using the CWTS topic scheme that was developed for the open line rankings. Each of their topics has 10 keywords associated with it. And the really nice part about this is that these are the most common words that are used sort of in, in these topics, but those same keywords can occur in multiple topics. So you could have, for instance, kelp as a keyword that's in many different topics. So that gives some more flexibility in increasing recall. Um, the way that we do this, I won't bore with details unless there's questions, but the, the general idea is each work has one primary topic and that one primary topic has 10 keywords, but I showed that there's actually more topics underneath that. We take the 10 keywords from each of the three top topics to get a candidate set of 30 keywords that we then match that work against. And we tried many different iterations of this. We tried using all of the keywords at the same time. We tried using just the primary topics. And actually, the most accurate results were coming from this approach of taking the keywords from the top three and using them as candidates. So that's where that's coming from. We can talk more about that later. Um, up to five keywords are assigned per work if they are all above a threshold. And usually they are. But if something doesn't go above a threshold, it won't get matched. And so that gives us 26,000. 730 keywords. I do want to say a quick point that we will be doing more uh, development on these to add more keywords and to refine this over the, over the next little bit. So please do give us feedback on them. But these are live now, both in the API and the user interface. So this is a screenshot I took today. You can see I, I filtered by institution Simon Fraser University. Their top keyword was HIV. So I clicked on that keyword just to show that you can apply it as a filter. Show me all the works that have this keyword but you can also use it as the group by. 
So for an author, a journal, an institute, you can now compare both the topics and the keywords sort of right next to each other. Okay. These are brand new and these are related to the CWTS classification. So you might not have read all of those and might not know them all. So I wanted to spend a moment talking about how you find the keywords that you wanna use. So for topics, um, this works really well, I think. If you search under the topic, something like, I, I search seaweed, these are all of the topics that come up. And you'll see none of these actually have seaweed in the title of the topic, but all of them have it somewhere in the description of that keyword. So that's working really well to help you increase uh, which topics you're looking for. The keywords don't work exactly like that because we don't have necessarily a description of the keywords yet. Um, but if you do search title, like kelp, for instance, it's going to bring up the keywords that have kelp in it. But another way you can go through this is start with a gold set. And it doesn't have to be a very formal gold set. It can just be, hey, I know that these journals are all related to my field. What are some of the keywords used in that field? And this is the example I gave. So you can see there's some, some phycology journals, and they're all combined with or. And I said, group by keyword, all of the publications from any of these journals. And you'll see some of the top keywords are macroalgae, ecosystem functioning, harmful algal blooms. So th these are ones that you can um, get an idea of what keywords exist. You can also hit more or export and get a fuller list other than just the top five. But this is a great way of finding keywords to start using in your queries. I do wanna give a caution, actually two cautions. The first is that when you search by a specific keyword, it increases the recall of other keywords as well. This is not the same with topics, because when you search a topic, you're only getting works that have that primary topic, because we haven't in the UI combined multiple topics per work. With keywords, and you can see here, I put as an example, keyword seaweed, it's returning other keywords as well, because they co-occur on the same work. So all of these works, there's 4,000 of them have seaweed as a topic, but you'll see there's some other keywords as well, or, uh, global seaweed distribution, marine algae. So this is a great way actually of finding additional keywords. Um, and it's less of a caution and more just to understand what's happening. But the caution comes in here. Um, you see there's an exclamation mark now. When you negate these. So if you exclude a specific keyword from your query, you're going to inadvertently reduce the recall of other keywords that co-occur with it. And here's an example to demonstrate what I mean. You can see from that same sort of search that I was using, if I say and add and not harmful algal blooms, then the next one, the, the counts of keyword for macroalgae or microalgae rather goes down because there were works that had both harmful algal bloom and microalgae. So when you exclude a keyword, you're also excluding other ones inadvertently. I see this all the time in the literature with Scopus queries when people exclude certain subject areas what you're actually doing there is excluding every journal that has that as a subject area, even if other things are published in it. So be really careful when you exclude things like this. Okay, just in the last couple of minutes, I wanna talk about searching the works. There are a lot of different fields that you can search in in Open Alex. When you're doing text-based query searching, the best and most helpful one is usually the title and abstract. Um, search, and this is the one at the bottom. This is searching for whatever words you put either in the title or in the abstract. There are some other ones. You can do title only. You can do full text, but keep in mind, we don't have access to all full text. So, um, and, and usually that will bring back way more than you're looking for because common words or words will get used somewhere in the paper that might not be something you're searching for. So that's usually the most helpful. Regardless of which fields you're searching, um, although I should say raw affiliation strings does have some differences, but most of them operate exactly like this. Stop words are automatically removed. And this is a list of them if you're not familiar with them. These words, if you type them in, will be removed before they're searched. Word stemming occurs. If you're not familiar with this, uh, there's a great example here below. The fox is jumping quickly becomes in the search, the fox jump quick, and then the is a stop word, so that ends up getting removed as well. So if you search the fox is jumping quickly or the fox jumps quicker, these are all things that are gonna give you the exact same search results. Um, and if you're interested in that, I put a link here to the KSTEM token. Um, that's the stemming that, we, that we're using through Elasticsearch. 
Boolean operators do work in open outlets, which is great, but they have to be capitalized. And the three that work are and, or, and not. So you can use and to say it has to have both of these things or to say it has either or not to say it does not have something. We do not have proximity operators like this word within three words of this word. Um, let us know if this is something that is, is helpful to have in the future, but uh, that's not su currently supported. And then finally, we do not have wildcards or fuzzy searches. So things like um, uh, asterisks or question marks or about symbols, even when using quotes, those get uh, sort of removed. So keep all of those in mind and let us know as you're building your queries if you run into any challenges. But just as a couple of examples of what that can look like, if you're searching in full text, the title or title and abstract, coriander or cilantro will give you all of the works that have either coriander or cilantro mentioned. Uh, this is really helpful when there's two words to describe the same thing in different contexts to get all of them. And then a, a more complex one that I like from our documentation is show me all the works that mention Elmo and Sesame Street, but do not mention Cookie or Monster. So this is trying to find all of the works that describe Elmo from Sesame Street that aren't in his relation to Cookie Monster. Researcher here, if you just type in researcher and hit enter, you're getting all of the works for researchers, but you're also getting research because those are stemming to the same word. So I wanted to say there are some situations where that's not gonna be helpful in getting the distinction you're looking for. And then just as something more complex to show with these parentheses, you can actually build some, some quite complex structure. So in this first one, I, I wanna know everything about seaweed ecology and evolution, but there's multiple words for seaweed. So I put in the first part, if kelp or seaweed or rockweed or macrophyte or macroalgae, if any of these are used, and there's also either ecology or evolution, return those works. Okay, I'm running at the, the end of the time, but I did wanna say, please contact us with feedback on this as you're developing your queries. We do have some events coming up that you should take a look at, including the open houses where we can work individually with you on your specific queries. Um, as well as our first user meeting that we're really excited about. So please check that out as well. And again, just a quick point on documentation. We want this to be as comprehensive and helpful as possible to all users around the world. So if you don't see something in there or if something could be worded differently, please let us know and we'll make sure to increase that. That's all I have. So thank you everyone for joining. I'll turn off the recording now and we can do sort of Q&A and talk through some of the specific questions. All right, thank you, take care.